Navigating the dynamics of the Korean Peninsula requires more than just information, it demands insight. Korea Risk Group offers strategic consulting that cuts through the noise. Our experts provide in-depth analysis, risk assessments and bespoke reports, all tailored to your specific needs. Whether you're exploring new opportunities or managing existing challenges, our insights can be your compass. To learn more about how we can help you make informed, strategic decisions, visit careerrisk.com slash solutions today. And welcome to the NK News Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Oswetsloot, and this episode was recorded in the NK News Studio on Tuesday, the 24th of September, 2024. And joining me after a week away, we have Colin Zwerko. Colin, welcome back. Thank you, Jacko. All right, you've chosen some stories for us. Let's talk about uh, Seoul has sent a warning to North Korea uh, with regard to these trash balloons. Now, we've talked a lot about the trash balloons before that North Korea has sent uh, in kind of irregular intervals to South Korea. What's South Korea's warning to North Korea about the balloons? Well, so yeah, the balloons, the balloon saga continues. And so we're living over here in South Korea. And every couple days, it seems, or every couple weeks, we'll get another alert about trash balloons are coming in from, from North Korea. And South Korea is trying not to make a big deal out of this. Yes, South Korea has to make some statements. So in the latest statements a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. The South Korean military is saying they will take decisive military action if, you know, some if it gets worse. And for now, North Korea wants it to be a, just a nuisance. They just want to send trash balloons and not provide a pretense for South Korea to respond. And South Korea is basically saying, if you give us that pretense, then we will respond. So we can expect it to just continue status quo now, which mm -hmm. is hundreds of trash balloons coming in. Last in this most recent one, a couple of days ago on Monday, they once again led to the what, suspension of flights at Incheon International Airport. Right, and that's ha happened several times over the last few months. Yeah, and so it, they halted flights for just an hour or two, but that still causes a lot of disruptions, and you don't and financial yeah. uh, loss as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it sounds like over the months, it's it's it sounds you know you, you sort of hear the word balloon coming over from North Korea with trash. It sounds like a, a light matter, literally lighter than air. But, uh, but these things do cause damage, right? So what, what's, the, what's the threat or what's the risk of these balloons? What are they doing? Yeah, and I, and I know we've talked about this issue a lot on our page and then you know, maybe in the podcast, but every single time they do it, it, it runs the risk of something going wrong that neither side wants. Mm -hmm. A balloon could land on a car or, or, or land in a, in a street, causing a car to swerve, someone could die. Right. Uh, and then South Korea would be forced to respond, and they don't really maybe want to cause uh, a big conflict. North Korea doesn't want that as well. For now, the South Korean military says they, the, the point to their response is to, quote, show that the enemy has nothing, nothing to gain from it. Right. So that means we want to just not respond in a big way and not give you what you want, which is some sort of, uh, you know, limited conflict where they can come out on top. Yeah, and, and going back to the damage there, I mean, these are, this is not a hypothetical situation. In the story that uh, Junha wrote for NK News last week, uh, there's mention of uh, roof fires being started by these trash balloons, also a car actually being damaged, $140,000 in property damage in the, the Seoul metropolitan area, uh, and a, uh, a cyclist who suffered minor injuries after a... a being hit by uh, a trash balloon. So that this is not, uh, yeah, as you say, we're only one car swerving into the on, on you know, the, the, a school, for example. Or uh, pedestrians. From, or a pedestrian crossing, right, from a serious accident, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, I mean, the, <laughs> another of the statements from, from uh, the South Korean military is kind of, kind of interesting from Monday. It says, quote, this is an internationally disgraceful and petty act aimed at creating discomfort and anxiety among our citizens and inciting internal conflict in our society. Now, I would say the same goes for the leaflets that South Korean activists send to North Korea. The goal is to 
cause people to think differently about their their government. But the difference is those are activist led and not government led. And mm-hmm. these from North Korea are government led. So what, I don't know where it goes from here, but it's it's very interesting. I think case study. Uh, more people around the world should probably be paying attention to it just for how mm. interesting it is because North Korea is also their response to South Korean propaganda loudspeakers mm-hmm. is to reportedly just play sounds of screaming and noises and things that are going to be creepy and eerie and bother people across the border. Right. These kinds of things are nuisance operations and it's mm-hmm. hard to respond as a military to them. And but there's also a quote in the story from uh, an analyst from Qaeda who suggested that, well, you know, it, it might just be trash now, but uh, what if North Korea starts to put more dangerous materials in, say, uh, explosives or, uh, you know, chemical warfare or b- bacteriological warfare, that this is a, a way to basically launch an aerial bombing campaign on, on a low scale and, and kind of below the threshold of actual warfare, but a, a way that can easily be escalated at a certain point. Yeah, I think those sorts of things North Korea would would know there's a bigger difference in right. response and i think that's what south korea is trying to say right now they're trying to lay out the red lines and say those are things you cannot do without uh, a response but certainly i've heard analyses that say this these are tests uh, mm-hmm. of the south korean response so maybe that would be a good plan in, in wartime or in a conflict time to utilize what they've learned from how south korea tracks and responds to these balloons if they're able to learn stuff like how south korea tracks south korea says they are tracking them from where they are in north korea until mm-hmm. they land because the weakness with balloons though is that you're always reliant upon winds and, and you know going in the right direction at the right speed and and air pressure and things it's not like drones that you're targeting them you know you're able to direct the flight with a balloon it may go out over the sea it may end up landing in your own property if you're not careful yeah. yeah, I don't know how I don't know how effective of a tool of war they would be, yeah. but certainly effective as a tool of nuisance. All right, let's go on to the next story there. I understand that uh, North Korea recently uh, not only launched a new ballistic missile, but actually had it land in its own territory, blowing up a piece of its own property. Yeah, th- this is an interesting story. So last week, uh, North Korea fired another miss, another short range ballistic missile test. This one is the Hwasong Eleven C. Uh, and they're calling it a 4.5 ton warhead, a wow. super large warhead is what they're saying. That, that sounds like a pretty big explosive. I mean, you need a, you know, you can't just drop that in an empty uh, plot of land in the city and <laughs> not expect it to create some damage around. You need a sure. big field to, to, lo- to let that land in. Yeah, so I'm going to have a story out either today or tomorrow. Uh, I located the test range, mm. uh, the inland test range. I haven't seen anyone else locate this yet, but it's... Oh, you mean where they're firing it from? No, where, oh, so where it actually lands. Where it landed. Ooh, the drop zone. Uh, and so the last time that they tested this missile back in July, mm-hmm. uh, it was interesting because they, and they've never really done this before, but they said in the in the state media report that we will test it. We, we tested it at a short and a, and a long range, and we will test it again mm-hmm. at a medium range sometime later in July. And then they just never did. Ah. And that kind of got overlooked. But South Korea military was saying that that the short range one was actually a failure and they're trying to pass it off as like a a short range intentional like different launching it at different ranges and Mm -hmm. south korea was like now that one probably failed but it seems to me like the test range up on the uh, and i don't have it written down right in front of me but it's right on the border of two counties up in north hamgyong province Ah. uh it's way inland in a in a a mountainous area no population centers Mm. anywhere near this uh, target range but it seems like they used that target range back in july and again now Ah. and so we're trying to learn stuff about the accuracy we know where they launched it from and we know where it landed and they say that it was a 320 kilometer about a 320 kilometer uh, distance Mm -hmm. it's a little bit off it was actually 332 kilometers so Unfortunately, we don't have an, a satellite image from the day of or the day before the launch, so we can't see where they painted their targets right. or painted or where they they set out their little X and circle targets. Because you're actually, you know, when you're with a missile, you're, you're aiming at something, right? It's yeah. not just landing in a field. Yeah, they're aiming at these targets. And, and if we could see the targets set out before the launch and then we can see that they were actually hit, that mm. would say a lot about their accuracy mm. in terms of us believing what they say about their accuracy. Right, because the reason we know about this launch, uh, well, one of the reasons is that North Korea actually publicized this in its uh, outward-facing uh, media, the KCNA. Yeah, they, they didn't post any photos back in July, but they did post, post photos this time. I think that I can see the target set 
days before, like even weeks before this. So I think it does say a lot about their accuracy. So um, watch out for that story. But I still have a little research to do on that. But I mean, that's also interesting. They didn't post, they didn't publish it in KCTV, the mm. state TV, or the Rodong Shinmun, the yeah. state newspaper. So it, it's as far as we know, it was only intended for international audiences. And this story also had this, it was like a weird mix of stories. It was Kim Jong-un looks at us as a short range missile test where they're talking about the accuracy. And then he goes and looks at some small rifles, uh, mm. sniper rifles and assault rifles and making a big deal about these, these rifles in state media recently. And overall, I think, and also I've seen other experts say this, this looks like it's an advertisement for Russia. Um, so, uh. This is a larger... Both the rifles and the missile. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's mainly a message for Russia. Hey, we've got good things to sell if you want them. Seems like that. And I guess the yeah. argument is, well, why would an advertisement be in state media? Mm. Well, it, it helps the legitimacy of the, of the, uh, the claims. Uh, if you're right. making it big and public, yeah. that's a little better than just sending over some photos to, to Putin's uh, Facebook or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, telegraph or yeah, telegram. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, good. Let us now move on to our third story of the day. Uh, now, North Korea is repaving or re uh, restoring uh, an airbase, uh, sorry, a runway at an airbase, which had been dismantled to use as a COVID disinfection site during the pandemic. Yeah, so this story is a little niche, but I think it, it's interesting just to, it, it, it paints the story of North Korea's COVID saga. Mm. So, Back in 2021, they decide to take the uh, to move out uh, some old Soviet era, like 1950s era bombers, IL-28 Which were not museum bombers. pieces. I mean, these no, are still, they're used. still using yeah. them. Yeah, they're they're a lot of people refer to them as obsolete. Mm -hmm. But North Korea has a, a few squadrons of these right. IL-28 bombers. They're not obsolete if you're still if someone's still using them. Yeah, and not very effective against other uh, what they're facing off against, but. You know, they can still drop bombs. But anyway, this airport, the Uiju airport up at the border with China mm. at the northwest corner next to Shineju, that was turned into a big, they, they moved out all the planes, they demolished a bunch of stuff, they built a rail line going into it, and they started to put imports there, disinfect them, and then quarantine them outside on the 1.5 mile long runway mm. for, you know, two, three months at a time because they were so scared of the virus coming into the country that right, they thought, Right, contact know, transmission. Yeah, a lot of people said, these, you know, you don't need to worry that much about mm. the virus on, on objects. But right. anyway, so they did that for a couple of years, but then uh, recently they destroyed all of the disinfection, quarantine-related infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And now we see in the last few days that they're starting to paint the stripes back on the runway. So the point of this story is that, well, a lot there's a lot of change uh, nationwide with North Korea's air bases, their air force. Kim Jong-un wants to upgrade the air, the air force, but they're, you know, a lot of people refer to their air force in general as uh, obsolete with uh, their really old jets. And they need, you know, that's another thing. Are they going to get jets from Russia sometime mm. soon? We don't know. Um, well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do we know about them making their own planes? Do they do that? They have made their own copies in the past, and right now they're making drones. Uh, they have some factories in North Pyongyang province in the Panghyun area where they have jet engine test cells. They supposedly they're making their big reconnaissance and combat drones there that they review that they uh, uh, showed off last year. Okay. So. I don't think that they would be producing any fighter jets, those, right. uh, but they could certainly get a couple or a certain amount from Russia. Mm. And uh, some experts in the past, like last year when the story, whenever Kim Jong-un went to that fighter jet factory up in Russia last year, the, the talk was that maybe they'll get a few to help the prestige of the Air Force, but this, that just having a, cert, a couple, few, whatever, is not going to change the game. And they're highly expensive mm. and... I don't know. They're giving Russia a lot of a lot of missiles, so yeah. We don't know what even some jet fighters that are twenty twenty five years old would be still welcome. I mean, if they're flying around illusions from the the Korean War era, then anything that's uh, more modern than that would be a welcome addition to the North Korean Air Force, right? Absolutely, and uh, I think having a few would be a prestige thing. But you know, they could still do something mm. in a in a war. <laughs> For a few minutes. And we've seen that prestige a little bit uh, when they have had uh, recent parades that they'll do 
some uh, fly-by aerial shows with uh, with some fighter jets, and uh, and they had that whole sort of Top Gun footage of the fighter jets in their uh, in their uniforms and the helmets, looking pretty cool. For sure, and there's probably some internal politics there that I don't understand about the Air Force, but he's Kim Jong Un focused his uh, investments and well, most of his attention on the ballistic missile forces <clears throat> throughout the the first eight or 10 years of his rule. And then now he's finally starting to publicly put attention back on the Navy and the Air Force. So we're seeing a lot of developments in those realms. Right. Okay. Well, and that was, uh, this is a story that you've written for NK Pro based on your satellite analysis uh, about the uh, the runway uh, being re rebuilt, repainted, reinstated after this dismantlement. So a uh, good story on that one. Uh, now our, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, very, very short, to uh, talk about Vietnamese military officials visiting North Korea. Uh, does that happen often? Uh, this kind of delegation has not happened at least since prior to the pandemic. Oh, okay. So we had a, a Vietnamese military delegation in North Korea. They met with the defense minister, Kang Soo Nam. They also visited a, uh, a special operations forces army base. Mm-hmm. They're saying a lot of stuff like um, they want quote, uh, this is translated from Vietnamese via Google Translate, but they want high-level delegations, training, cooperation, military, cultural, and military sports exchanges, research, and implementation of cooperation, blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're talking about defense industry, cooperation, military technology. These are all things that are sanctioned, uh, mm. not, not prohibited under UN sanctions, which uh, both North Korea and Vietnam are a party to. Right. And... So what I what I want to look for with this is what is the response from other countries who are partners of Vietnam, the U.S. Uh, I haven't seen a response from the U.S. yet. Uh, this was a story last week. Um, I'm wondering if if uh, I don't know what what we'll do on this story this week, but I think we need to know what the U.S. Yes, we need to talk this. about that because the U.S. has been particularly close to Vietnam in the last few years um, in terms of military dialogue. And I don't know, I have a vague memory. Weren't there even some joint drills or some, some things? They've done some military things together, right? Kind of a, as a way of, uh, of warning off China against making claims on, on Vietnamese territory. And so now to see Vietnamese military officials and, and, and defense minister or vice minister uh, visiting Pyongyang, this is very unusual. There aren't many countries that do that, that talk to U.S. military officials and North Korean military officials. Yeah, I think, I think there are a certain amount of these countries and, and uh, you know, they want to balance, they, they, you know, the U.S. cannot, it, unless it depends on what kind of leverage the U.S. wants to try right. to put on them. And I think the U.S. did a lot of that back in the 2016, 2017, sanct- uh, the height of U.N. sanctions. They mm-hmm. were able to threaten countries with this or that and say, if you don't support the sanctions, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. We, I'm not a Vietnam uh, expert, so I don't know no. what the U.S. would want to even push on that. Mm. And we don't know where this is going exactly. Probably not the level of the Russia-North Korea relations, right. military exchanges. Uh, the, the Vietnamese Lieutenant... Okay, I don't even want to try to pronounce his name, but they, they invited the North Korean uh, defense minister to go to the... Defense Exhibition 2024 in Vietnam in December. Oh. And he'll look around at weapons, I guess. I don't know. They, this kind of thing hap- has happened in Russia. Yeah. This kind of thing has happened in Syria in years past. I guess we'll see. Very interesting. And, of course, worth reminding our listeners that, uh, you know, uh, back in, in 2019, it was uh, Hanoi that was the uh, the site of the second Trump-Kim summit, partly because Vietnam has friendly relations with both con- countries. Yeah, great point. Uh, and it has... Uh, embassies in both Pyongyang and in Seoul, so this is definitely a story to keep an eye on. Uh, thanks, Colin, for coming on the show and telling us about this. Thanks, Jacko. See you again. Explore the unofficial world of DPRK-inspired apparel at NK News Shop. Dive into a captivating collection of North Korea-themed T-shirts, hoodies, and more at the NK News Shop. From the popular Taedonggang beer t-shirts to the adventurous Air Cordio designs, each piece offers a unique glimpse into aspects of the DPRK you'll be familiar with. Featuring retro travel-inspired prints of Pyongyang's landmarks and brands, our apparel is 100% handcrafted in the USA. Support independent journalism with every purchase. Explore our range today at shop.nknews.org. That's shop.nknews.org.
Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our podcast episode for today. Our thanks go to Brian Betts and Alana Hill for facilitating this episode and to our post-recording producer genius, Gabby Magnuson, who cuts out all the extraneous noises, awkward silences, bodily functions, and fixes the audio levels. Thank you, and listen again next time.